The United States of America is 20, 248 years old since it, its independence. And for that entire two and a half centuries, no vice president of the United States has undergone a process of removal by way of impeachment. In a way, we are making history. And for me, it is such a, an important occasion for the 13th Parliament and this Senate that it will go down in the annals of history that the first impeachment of a deputy president in the Republic of Kenya was undertaken by this particular Senate. And we come here with a lot of confidence that the Senate is not new to the process of impeachment as understood under our Constitution. Indeed, the Senate has handled so many impeachment proceedings in relation to the offices of governors and deputy governors. And more importantly, that this, this Senate has been a great contributor in establishing the jurisprudence revolving around the impeachment process in the Republic of Kenya. Many of the cases that have gone for determination in the, our system of courts, high courts, court of appeal, and the Supreme Court have involved the participation of the Senate. So as we address you today, we are not addressing a chamber that is dealing with a novel idea. Indeed, by dint of Article 10 of the Constitution, which requires all state organs and state officers to make any decisions or apply the law and the Constitution, they are required to apply the Constitution of the Republic of Kenya. That is by dint of Article 1, Article 10, sub Article 1. So it should not be lost to anybody that the application of the Constitution in decision making is entirely in the province of the courts. This Senate on this particular issue, you are seized of this matter. It is an exclusive jurisdiction that is granted to the Senate to undertake a trial for the, uh, for the impeachment and removal of a deputy governor or our governor, or deputy president, or president. This is an exclusive jurisdiction that even the courts have spoken about many times. The courts can intervene in limited, unjustified occasions that merit their intervention. But it should never be lost that this is the trial court, if I may put it that way. And we also come here knowing that the Senate now is a repository of the law in regard to impeachment. All the cases involving the impeachment of governors and deputy governors that have gone to the courts have involved the participation of the Senate. So if ever we are to talk about a repository of the law regarding removal of state officers by way of impeachment, it is the Senate. 
And it should not be lost historically from comparative studies, various jurisdictions, why this role in our constitutional design was left to the Senate. It was a decision by the framers of our constitution that this should be an exclusive matter to be dealt by the Senate. Having said that, I was advised by the leadership of our National Assembly, who are clients, to read a certain page passage from the Bible. I think I have a copy here. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I had to carry this particular Bible. I was so advised. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I read the Bible a lot to myself, but never in this kind of occasion. Uh, and this is the book of Exodus uh, 22, verse 22 and 23. And I'm reading, I read both the St. James Version, which is the one I prefer uh, because of the language, and from the Living Bible, which is, which is in English is more appropriate. And I read, that is from the King James Version. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. And my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with a sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. From the Living Bible version, it reads as follows. And the language is a, more, a little bit more palatable. You must not oppress, or you must not exploit widows or orphans. If you do so in any way, and they cry to me for my help, I, sh I shall surely give it and my anger shall flame out against you, and I will kill you with enemy arm, armies, so that your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. This is the Lord of the Old Testament. Now, I will come back to this matter later, but for now, I want to walk a constitutional journey with the Senate in giving a panoramic view of what our constitutional order is, is in regard to the office of the president and the deputy president. Under the old constitution, we had no provisions that, like, the, like the ones we have in this constitution. But this constitution, and I want to persuade the Honorable Senate, that it does not just address rights as, as contemplated in the Bill of Rights, but it also addresses fears. Fears out of a long struggle and experience of the people of Kenya. And in Kenyan, the Kenyan people having given themselves this constitution, they were addressing rights and fears, and more importantly, they wanted to establish a system of government that can work. And with that, I want to take your, the Senate to Article 75, of the Constitution just to draw the attention of the House of the seriousness of what the matter we are dealing with, uh, which is 
provisions in relation to oath of office of state officers. 74. Before assuming office, uh, before assuming a state office, acting in a state office, or performing any functions of the state office, a person shall take and subscribe the oath or affirmation of office in the manner and form prescribed by the third schedule or under an act of parliament. Mr. Speaker, I want to take you to that schedule and I want to draw a difference, a distinction between the oath of office that is administered to the president and the deputy president as opposed to the other oaths that are taken by other state officers, including members of parliament. And there's a big distinction. And when it comes to the oath of the due execution of office for the president and that of the deputy president, which is found in the third schedule of the Constitution, there are words there that I would plead to the Senate to consider in consideration to the matters which are raised in the motion of impeachment by the National Assembly and the charges as they've been read out here. Now, the motion, the, the oath for or solemn affirmation for due execution of office for the deputy president reads as follows. I do swear solemnly affirm that I will always truly and diligently serve the people and the Republic of Kenya in the office of the deputy president. I pause there to emphasize those words that are found in the Constitution that I will always truly and diligently serve the people of Kenya, that is the Republic of Kenya, and it continues to say as follows that I will diligently discharge my duties and perform my function in the state office to the best of my judgment, that I, would, I, I will at all times, when so required, faithfully and truly give my counsel and advice to the President of the Republic of Kenya, and that I will do justice to all without fear. I emphasize the word doing justice to all. Those three words in the oaths and, uh, and, and uh, formations of, for due execution of office, which are found in the third schedule, are not contained in similar words when it comes to the Speaker of the Senate, the Speaker of the National Assembly, the Chief Justice. It only applies to the Deputy President and the President. Why am I saying this? Because if you look at the Constitution in terms of the election of the President and, yeah, yeah, and the Deputy President, you, you'll find that, Mr. Speaker, sir, that uh, the President and the Deputy President are elected at constituencies at constituencies. And in that election, they must receive a majority of votes in at least half the constituencies in the Republic of Kenya. What I'm not trying to say, it has come out, and I say this with utmost respect, that the president who stands here on trial by the Senate would assume that he was elected to represent the interests of a certain region. Whereas the Constitution is clear, he's elected by the whole 
country. He's got no area to protect. Under the old constitution, the president had to be elected from a constituency, a vice president had to be elected from a constituency as a member of parliament. This constitution has no similar provisions. And now when you come to the functions of the deputy president, and I think this is extremely important in the kind of relationship that there should be between the president and the deputy president, it says so in the following words, which I need to read for clarity uh, in terms of the deputy uh, president. And those are found in Article 147, that he shall be the supreme, principal assistant, deputized for the president in the execution of the uh, president functions, and also he may be assigned duties by the president. The kind of symbiotic relationship that should exist between the president and the deputy president, pre president is underlined in this constitution. Now, it is uncontestable, and I think this is the, main, the, 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 the issue that I want to deal with uh, in some detail. It is uncontestable from the record that you have, even from the deputy president, that the words he is accused to have uttered where he alleges that Kenya is like a company existing of shareholders, that does not sit with the Constitution of the Republic of Kenya. Kenya is not a republic that is established on the basis of shareholding. It's a republic of, of citizens. So when a deputy president talks about taking the East interests or what were Morema, or whatever that would mean, it is not in compliance with his constitutional remit. And the words are there, what he has said in public on this issue is very clear. The second issue is on the question of collective responsibility. You would find out from the constitution that in nearly all the important constitutional bodies established under the Constitution, the Deputy President is a member of those particular institutions or organs, like the National Security Council. So one would wonder where even the issue of the Director of Intelligence would be discussed in a public forum by the de Deputy President when he is the second in command in the national security intelligence as established under the constitution. So I would want and I plead with the, uh, with the Senate, look at the utterances of the deputy president vis-a-vis -vis his role under the, constitu under the constitution. And he has even said that where he has said certain things that are deemed to be insightful, that that is protected speech. It cannot be protected speech under our Constitution. Because under Article 33 of the Constitution, Constitution, because of what we have undergone as a nation, Article 33, sub-Article 2 has the lim limitation that the expressions that extend to war, uh, propaganda for war, incitement to violence, hate speech, advocacy of hatred, that cannot be uh, protected speech. Now, the other very important point, which I want to put before the uh, Senate, sometime in February 2017, the Deputy President traveled to London, and he went to a hospital in London where his brother was admitted in ICU, when he arrived the next day, 
he prevailed upon his brother to execute a will. That was on the 17th of February, 2020, uh, 2017. In that trip, there is no evidence at all that he tried to talk to doctors or physicians who are looking after his own brother. After this visit, he walked away. And seven days later... Mr. Speaker, I rise to raise an objection. Can I proceed? Mr. Speaker, we owe the Deputy President very elementary decency. We owe it to the Deputy President to be basically decent in these proceedings. I want to know whether counsel at the one can adduce this kind of evidence that is not contained in any evidentiary material before the Senate. I want to know which ground in the 11 grounds in the impeachment motion is this evidence from the bar supporting. I repeat, Mr. Speaker, we owe the Deputy President the most basic decency. I object. Senior Counsel Orango, those abutments, are they contained? They are, they are contained. They are all here. They and are refer all, to the document. Volume 4. I, I am not referring because if I've got to refer to every document, we take a lot of time. And I have only 30 minutes. Uh, if you look at Volume 4, uh, of this document on public participation uh, from page page uh, the volume four of the National Assembly of the National Assembly pages pages 114 so, Yes, and in fact, this, this page is also contained the will, and the deputy president is the one who is relying on this will. Uh, the death certificate is contained on page 119. And it shows the only person who attended the disease the brother of the deputy president at that time was his daughter, was the only person uh, present. And then there's the will. And in the documents on page 128, and this is why I was raising this matter, on page 128, there's a letter by Mr. Madenge and Mr. Njoroge Rigeru, who together with Mr. Rigazi Gachagua were the joint will ex executors. And they are complaining about the conduct and action of the deputy president as an executor of the will and a family member of the late Nderitu Gachagua on page 129, paragraph 8. There, and it says, from bank statements to this, for this account seen by us, you transferred some funds from this account to other persons as follows. On the date, on when Deritu Gachagua died on the 24th. The deputy president was already withdrawing money. On the day he died. On the day he died. And that day when he died, he was there only with his daughter. And then they say on the 19th of May 2017, again another money was withdrawn and paid to Mrs. Wamuyuro Investment Limited. This story, you will find it in the documentation. And 
part of it is what Mr. Njomo was saying. Counsel for Deputy President, just have your seat. When your time comes, you'll be able to make the rebuttals. Proceed, uh, Senior Counsel. How many minutes do I have? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I respect your direction. I'm willing to take a seat right away, but just to point out something. The document you are being referred to is the document you held in abeyance no, because no, it was given to us no, later no, no, no. for purposes of no, our no. consideration. That's number one. Number two, Mr. Speaker, you remember that my learned colleague talked about how my client traveled to London, how without talking to any doctor, these are factual claims. Mr. Speaker, that are just coming from the bar. Mr. Speaker, number three, the opening statement speaks to the motion and the grounds in the motion. I beseech this House direct that parties restrict themselves to the motion and the grounds in the motion. The, the facts you are now being uh, referred to have no basis in the motion and the grounds the motion, unless the senior counsel, His Excellency uh, Governor Rengo, can draw your attention to any ground in the motion that those facts are not addressing. Sir. I repeat what I said, Mr. Speaker. The ruling is yours. We owe it to the Deputy President and the integrity of our checks and balances institutions to maintain basic decency in these proceedings. Yeah, yeah. I rest. Yeah. Uh, in fact, no, uh, uh, Counsel, I cannot tell you how you're going to make your opening statements. If you're going outside the allegations, that's up to you. The senators are here listening, and they'll be able to make the necessary decision at the end of it. Now, Senior Counsel Orengo, there's an environment that you've made that the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya on a certain date that you indicated, travel to London. Yes. The, the to evidence visit is his sick brother. Yes. And on the side of the sick bed, he made his brother sign a will. Is that contained anywhere? in the documents if, from the National Assembly. My, my, my Lord, if, if, uh, you, if, Mr. Speaker, if you look at volume four from the pages that I, I indicated, right from page 113, it shows what flight it took, at what time, a British Airways flight on the, 17th, on, on the 16th, and arrived in London on the 17th, the only business that comes out from that document and his documents is that he got a will signed and there is no further evidence of his activities in London until 24th when the only activity in which he didn't participate was to be present when his brother died in London. But all this I'm saying in relation to the allegations that we have against the Deputy President. Mr. Speaker, sir. No, uh, Council, ordinarily, yes. Yes. no objections are raised during the 30 minutes of the opening statements. Ordinarily. Yes. I have tried to accommodate, but now we are, you are stretching my generosity a bit too far. Allow Senior Council Orengo to conclude in your opening statement, you may choose now, now, what, to make a rejoinder. What I want to conclude is this. From what I've said, from the way his brother's account were raided, that was continued in to the time when all life guidance was acquired for a, a sale by a proxy of 412 million shillings. He bought property in Nyeri, uh, the outspan, and treetops for an amount exceeding 800 million shillings. And we're saying part of that money was not money coming from him, and evidence will show that he was raiding monies that truly belonged to the estate of his late brother to acquire property. 
if that is not an offense by law, uh, these were proceeds of crime committed by the deputy president to acquire property. And to drive this point home, the judgment by Justice Minor, which is also part of the record, where he made, she made a determination, and that judgment stands that the 200 million shillings that was found in an account with a financial institution in excess of 200 million shillings were proceeds of crime. And that 200 million shillings, again, the documentation here, if you look at it and we show it in evidence, was the same money that was used to acquire treetops and abadeas as part of the money that he, his, his sons were able to use to acquire those, 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 those properties. So we are saying that the acquisition of these properties came out of criminal conduct. And all the particulars of the, those, the criminal conduct is found in the documents that we have presented before, before the Senate. Now, Mr. Speaker, I think that it is critical that uh, we look at the authority of the office of the Deputy President vis-a-vis -vis that of the President, the doct doctrine of collective responsibility. And I showed why the office of the Deputy President is so important in carrying certain functions so long as he, he lives to the true spirit of the Constitution. Many times, and the incidents have been shown, acts of insubordination, like when he went, he issued a press statement in Mombasa after the president himself had issued a statement that went contrary, absolute ins ins insubordination to the president, who is his boss. Uh, and if really one can talk about insubordination, that was an act of insubordination. Lastly, the other issue that I need to bring out quickly is that uh, the Constitution and the Senate is aware of the fact that at the end of at the, at every five years, you pass a, a basis for allocation of resources here in the Senate. And they abide by certain principles which are contained in Article 203 of the Constitution. This issue about certain areas being preferred because, because they are shareholders goes against the very spirit of the Constitution. Or the notion that people can be appointed into government on the basis of how uh, they voted or on the basis that they are shareholders, that is not again born by the Constitution because the executive authority that is granted to the executive requires that even in allocation of revenue and appointment of people to serve in the public service must depend on regional balance. So to talk about shareholders, to talk about some people being able to reap on the basis of shareholding, that is repugnant and in conflict with the provisions in our, in our, constitu uh, in our Constitution. Now, I, Mr. Speaker, I would want to say this with all the seriousness it deserves. This Constitution is supposed to work. It's supposed to work. And it can only work if state officers are compliant with the provisions of the Constitution. Two minutes to wind up. Yeah. Well, if they're compliant, compliant with the provisions of the Constitution. The doctrine of collective responsibility and the authority of members of the cabinet spring from the fact that they are all individually and collectively uh, responsible to, to the president. If that primary principle cannot be applied, then it will be difficult for 
any government elected to function in a manner that it can deliver services to the people of the Republic of Kenya. So I urge this honorable Senate that uh, having painted that large picture, the next phase, when you are now going to listen to the evidence and look at the exhibits that we have attached, you will find that a strong case has been made out for the impeachment and removal from office of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. And this Senate should not shy away from undertaking that responsibility. It does not matter that there is a matter that could be taken to DCI or to the AACC. The role of Senate is different to undertake oversight over those who are given responsibility to manage the affairs of the country. And that does not depend on the role of any other agency or body created by the Constitution. Your role is to demonstrate to all people in state offices that this oversight you, 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 uh, role that you play, whether it is that of impeachment, to demonstrate to the people of Kenya that it is not cosmetic. And where there's evidence, like the evidence that we are showing and that you've seen before you, that person. I'm afraid, should, Senior Counsel, your time is up. Should suffer the consequences. I thank you. I thank you.